economics of immigration. It's one of the most divisive topics for debate and discussion today in the United States because it touches on race, sex, national origin, crime, the use of public services. The list goes on and on and on. What I'm going to try to do today is to shed some light on this topic going all the way back to the 1790s and look at immigration statistics and the impact of immigration on the United States economy and more particularly the construction market. I'm going to introduce the idea of immigrants as complements as well as immigrants as substitutes. Let's go ahead and get started. Economics of immigration. I'm going to walk you through some history, some background, and perspectives on immigration into the United States, going all the way back to the 1790s. This is a topic, however, that is very divisive. It speaks to the concepts of race, national origin, sex, crime, use of public services. The list goes on and on and on that Americans are concerned and worried about. What I hope to do today, however, is to shape your thinking. And so with that, I'm going to try to shed some light on immigration policy and practices that have shaped the United States going all the way back to the late 1700s. And then I want you to think forwards and look at what the future of the United States might look like. There's three big topics I'm going to speak to today. Number one, immigration history. Number two, what the impacts are to growth and prosperity and labor market, effects of immigration. And lastly, I'm going to make a modest proposal. I can't claim this modest proposal of my own, but it is from Representative Maria Salazar from the great state of Florida, who laid out what she refers to as the Dignity Act. And I'm going to shed some light on the key components of that act and hopefully cause you to support it. With that, let me begin with this idea that going all the way back to the 1790s, the U.S. has been preoccupied with legislation, policy, and practice as it relates to immigration. Almost all of this activity is restrictive in nature in some fashion. Yet time and time again, what you see when you look back over the arc of history is that immigrant populations have transformed the size, the shape, and the nature of America. And looking forward, they will likely do so again. As we begin the discussion of the economics of immigration, let me shape your worldview. As an example, there's two ways you might look at immigration. One, immigrants as complements to American workforce and citizens. Secondly, immigrants as substitutes for American workforce and citizens. Let me give you a real life example. Some of you might consume coffee in the morning and also might consume a donut. Those items are complements of one another. As coffee consumption goes up, donut consumption is likely to go up. Those items don't serve as substitute. Said another way, you're likely to consume both. Coffee and tea, however, are substitutes of one another. No person in the morning would consume both coffee and tea. They're going to choose one or the other. And so in that context, they're substitutes. When you think about this from an economic standpoint, complements, because they go together, the supply and the demand and the pricing don't tend to affect the consumption because they're married together. Whereas substitutes, the changes in supply or demand or pricing do affect one another. As an example, if coffee pricing were to go up significantly, you likely would see more consumption of tea in the morning because of the higher price of coffee. From a construction standpoint, you might look at something like potholing using vacuum excavation in advance of trenching as a complement. That's a, a technique that's used to accelerate the productivity or the execution of trenching and is done in advance of trenching. In that context, if you saw more trenching activity taking place, you likely would see more potholing using vacuum excavation in advance of that trenching as a way to accelerate it. In digging a trench, however, open trench versus directional drilling, those two techniques are substitutes to one another. You can't choose both to install any segment of pipe. So in that context, you would choose one or the other. Next, let's explore the history of legislation and policy as it relates to immigration over the centuries. 
Before we begin, let me give you a quick immigration overview. The U.S. has a long history, going back to 1790, of working on immigration policy and practice. Nearly all of it is restrictive in nature. Yet time and time again, immigrant populations have transformed the size and the shape and the nature of America. Let's go to the video. At the time of the first census in 1790, most U.S. residents were of English, Irish, or German descent, but a majority of immigrants in the 18th century were Africans forced into slavery, representing one-third of U.S. immigrants. Africans forced into slavery dropped significantly after the 1808 slave trade ban. European migration continued to dominate. The Industrial Revolution drew thousands more from Europe who came looking for work in factories and on railroads, for example. Immigrants from China began arriving in San Francisco in the 1850s as word of the gold rush spread. At the same time, millions of Irish came to the U.S. seeking refuge from the Great Famine. Between 1860 and 1880, introduction of steam-powered ships made the journey to the U.S. faster and cheaper for immigrants from all locations, except the Chinese, who were banned in 1882 from immigrating to the U.S. for the next 60 years. By 1900, immigration was surging. Many were coming to the U.S. looking for an escape from violence abroad. This includes Jews fleeing pogroms in Russia, Mexicans displaced by the revolution, and Armenians trying to escape genocide. After World War I, the U.S. instituted quotas to reduce the flow of immigrants. Immigration slowed even further by the Depression and the start of World War II. Between 1940 and 1960, the U.S. accepted over 400,000 immigrants who were displaced persons after World War II. By 1960 to 1980, immigration surged again. In 86, Reagan signed the Immigration Reform Act, granting amnesty to over 3 million aliens. Between 2000 and 2010, U.S. immigration to the U.S. continued to rise, especially from Asia and Mexico and the Caribbean. Today, more than one in eight Americans are immigrants and almost all are descendants of immigrants. Less than 2% of the U.S. population have Native American ancestors. I first want to speak to the 1800s. I'm actually going to go back to the 1790s. There are two pieces of substantial legislation that took place during this time period that I want to talk to. First is the Naturalization Act of 1790. This act was put in place in order to restrict citizenship exclusively to white Americans. It was designed specifically to exclude African Americans from the likelihood of becoming citizens. Later, in the mid-1800s, you started to see Chinese immigration into the U.S., and those of you who are students of history will recall that the Transcontinental Railroad, when it was constructed in the late 1860s and early 1870s, on the eastern portion of it was primarily constructed by Irish immigrants who came to the U.S. from Ireland fleeing famine and seeking job opportunities. On the western portion, it was primarily constructed by Chinese immigrants fleeing famine and poverty. What you saw in the 1870s as the work began to come to a close is the state of California began to implement state policies that would restrict Chinese immigration. The state was sued, it ultimately went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that immigration policy is the domain of the federal government. All of the laws that the federal government either passes or the absence of law would supersede state law and state regulation, and that's what you found in the state of California. In order to implement that type of restriction on Asian and Chinese immigration, that became one of the first pieces of legislation that was passed at the federal level, which is the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. And that act had its intended effect. It dramatically reduced and eliminated Chinese immigration to the United States and more broadly, Asian immigration during that time period. The geographic growth and industrial revolution in the late 1800s opened the doors to the 1900s. Let's explore immigration legislation and policy during that century. So the 1900s was one of the most active periods for immigration legislation. There were nine pieces of significant legislation that were passed during this period. One of the early pieces was in the early 1900s that dramatically restricted Japanese immigration to the United States. There was one in 1924 that set up quotas on a country-by-country -country basis where countries that were considered desirable had larger quotas, countries that were considered undesirable had smaller quotas. That leads into the 1964 Act, which set up the current chain migration structure 
that we're operating under today. The last piece of consequential legislation during this period, however, was in 1986 and passed and signed into law during the Reagan administration. And this particular act had two key components to it. One was it granted amnesty to approximately three million individuals who were into the United States illegally. And secondly, Congress was supposed to set aside funding for more strict and stringent border controls. The first part of the act was fully implemented, which is the amnesty, which was granted. And then the second part of the act was not fulfilled because Congress did not follow up with the appropriate funding for the border controls. During the 1900s, the global conflicts caused a significant increase in demand for immigration, but restrictive policies were put in place consistently. What will the 2000s bring? Let's take a look. The short answer is not much. The last piece of consequential legislation, as I mentioned, was passed in 1986. The first piece that occurred post the turn of the century was the DREAM Act, which was proposed but never passed into law. It was designed to protect individuals who had come to the United States as children illegally with their parents and have lived their most, if not all, of their lives in the United States. The idea was that those individuals, while illegal immigrants, would not have to be forced to leave the United States. That was, again, worked on in 2012 through what's called the DACA legislation, which was passed via executive order. That's the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And then in 2022, Representative Salazar from Florida proposed the Dignity Act, which during the time where the Congress was Democrat controlled, the act did not move through committee, nor was it debated in Congress. Global conditions and policy impacts show up in the data. Let's take a look. So this first chart speaks to legal immigration going all the way back to the early 1800s. There's a series of waves of immigrants that came to the US. This includes the gold rush of the 1850s, the influx of immigrants to support the Transcontinental Railroad and other geographic growth in the United States. In the 1880s, there was significant Eastern European immigration to the United States. Post-World War I, there was significant immigration from displaced persons. Post-World War II, there was another wave of immigration of displaced people. In the 1980s, there was significant immigration both from Asia and the Americas, and that immigration from the Americas has continued to the present time. From an illegal immigration standpoint, you see some of the same things. There were a series of waves of illegal immigrants that entered the country, and this particular chart shows only the immigrants that were caught, returned, removed, or expulsed in some fashion. The only thing we know for sure is that this chart only represents a portion of the individuals that entered the country. And so when you look back at World War II, there was a significant number of illegal immigrants that were fleeing Europe, and there were displaced persons that came to the U.S., you see the same thing in the 1970s and into the early 80s, mostly fleeing from Asia, particularly Southeast Asia. In 1986, the uh, passage of the act that granted amnesty to illegal immigrants that were already in the country saw another spike in illegal immigration. And then as you get into more modern times in the 1990s and into the current period, most of the immigration is coming from the greater Americas, which includes Mexico, Central America, and South America. When you look at these statistics in combination, what you see is that there was a change post-1986 with the passage of the act that granted amnesty to illegal immigrants. What that shows is that there was an influx of additional illegal immigration that took place after that point, as well as an increase in legal immigration. Why might there have been more illegal immigration during that time period? The answer is simple and practical. Once you see that there's an opportunity to become a legal resident or citizen of the United States by receiving amnesty through legislation, that provides encouragement for you to potentially come to the United States, and a lack of border controls make it possible for you to cross the border in some fashion. And so you see both of these things in work today. Next, what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about a couple of case studies and explore some specific pieces of legislation individually. First is the Chinese Exclusion Act. So this took place in 1882. It was in response to the significant increase of Chinese immigration that took place in the 1860s and the 1870s, a large portion of which served and worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. And what you see is this act had its intended effect. It resulted in an elimination, almost a complete reduction in immigration from China and more broadly from across Asia. 
This particular act stayed in force for 60 years and was not repealed until the late 1940s, early 1950s. And so over that entire time period, there was very little Asian immigration to the United States during the period this act was in force. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Immigration Act of 1924. This was the first piece of comprehensive legislation focused on immigration. It included quotas on a country by country basis in order to limit the number of immigrants that would come from specific countries as opposed to regions. And these particular countries were selected based upon their desirability or their undesirability. And what you see after the implementation of this act is exactly what it was intended to do. It was designed to restrict immigration from, by certain groups and encourage immigration by other groups. And it had those effects looking forward. The Immigration Act of 1965 superseded the 1924 Act. This particular act moved to something that's referred to as chain migration and an idea that individuals get preferential treatment in terms of entering the country legally if they happen to have a relative or representative that's in the country currently. And so this particular act was focused on the idea of trying to reconnect families within the United, extended families within the U.S. This act is still in effect, and it's the basis of what our immigration policy is today with very minor refinements since that time period. The Dignity Act that Representative Salazar has proposed would be one of the things that would supersede and augment this particular act in terms of how immigration would take place going forward. So next, I want to talk about this idea of growth, prosperity, and labor market effects of immigration. There's a host of topics that we're going to speak to as it relates to this, and I want to help you understand some of the math behind it. So I want to take you back to where we started in the beginning, this idea or worldview as immigrants as a complement to native-born and citizen labor, immigrants as a substitute for native-born or citizen labor. The idea of complements is that immigrants come into the United States and do not displace native-born workers, but act as a growth factor or an increase to the economy versus the concept of immigrants as substitutes, meaning that they are going to displace native-born or citizen workers and not necessarily increase or result in the increase in the growth of the economy. So with that, I want to walk through some statistics with you. First of all, we're going to look at the relationship between immigration and unemployment. We're going to look at the relationship between immigration and workforce participation, the relationship between immigration and gross domestic product, the relationship between immigration and the consumer price index or inflationary pressure. And then I'm going to revisit this idea of substitutes and complements. And I'm also going to touch on this idea of the impact of public services from an immigration standpoint, wage impacts, and then capital investment impacts. So first, let's look at immigrant impact to unemployment. So these statistics go all the way back to the 1940s and look at what the results are you see in this particular chart a comparison of legal immigration, illegal immigration, compared to the general unemployment rate and the construction unemployment rate. What the math shows, there is no correlation between these figures over this time period. And so what this implies is that immigrant labor is not a substitute for native-born labor. Now with that said, we know mathematically that you cannot pour an unlimited amount of immigrant labor into an economy and have all of it absorbed. But when you look backwards in time over this era, what you see is that unemployment is unaffected by immigration, which means that these individuals have been absorbed into the workforce and are contributing to economic growth and are not directly impacting unemployment. Another nuance here is the U.S. is a giant country most of the immigration is coming in on coastal borders or land borders, and it is possible that that immigrant population has a more extreme impact in those cities, counties, or even those states. But what we're looking at here in this case is the totality of the U.S., and I ask that you shape your view to look at the totality of the U.S. in terms of the benefit that occurs. So again, just to reiterate, immigrant population, legal and illegal, has no correlation to unemployment statistics going back to the 1940s. Second, workforce participation. So let me share with you the definition of workforce participation. It's made up of all the individuals 
between ages 17 and 65 who could be employed and might take home a W-2 or a 1099. So what percentage of those individuals are receiving a W-2 or 1099? Some portion of the population always is not working. Some of them might be students. Some of them might be homemakers. Some of them might be individuals that are between jobs and searching for employment. We never have workforce participation of 100%. There are two interesting spikes in workforce participation. One was in the 1940s during the Second World War as women entered the workforce in order to take jobs that had previously been occupied by men who were fighting conflicts in Asia and in Europe. The second is the 1970s when women began to more aggressively enter the workforce. And you see workforce participation peak in that 1940s period and in that 19, late 1970s, early 1980s time period. And then we stayed at a high level and we've been trending down since the late 90s slightly. Now what you see when you look at legal and illegal immigration compared to workforce participation is a strong positive correlation. What that implies is that immigrant labor is a complement to domestic labor, not a substitute. And so when you see these trends over this period of time, those individuals who have come to the United States, both legally and illegally, have been absorbed into the workforce and have not displaced native-born or citizen workforce. Third, when you look at legal and illegal immigration in comparison to gross domestic product, what you see there is no statistical correlation again. What this implies is that there is no direct relationship between economic growth and illegal or legal immigration. Said another way, these individuals are absorbed into the economy and do not result in some type of slowdown of economic growth as those immigrants have come. Fourth. Legal and illegal immigration compared to the consumer price index or inflationary pressure. Now what you might see here is a connection between immigrant population and inflationary pressure. What shows up in the math? There is no correlation, meaning that higher legal or illegal immigration is not resulting in higher or lower inflationary pressure. So said another way, Immigrant populations across the totality of the U.S. has not resulted in an increase or a decrease in wages, which is one of the measures of inflation. So this brings me to a, do some math that I want to kind of walk you through and reconnect back to where we started. This idea of immigrants as complements versus immigrants as substitutes. Now we know mathematically that if you have enough immigrant population, at some point it is not possible economically, workforce-wise, housing-wise, to absorb all of that population. That is a mathematical certainty. What we do not know is where that point is. And so with that said, when you look back over the arc of time, what you see in these statistics is that the rising and decreasing rates of immigration don't show up in unemployment statistics, don't show up in GDP statistics, don't show up in inflation statistics, and that they have been successfully absorbed into the workforce, again, looking at the totality of the U.S. Now, what I'd like for you to do looking forwards is to try to figure out how do we create an opportunity for there to be more effective legal immigration, key on more, and secondly, more effective border control to reduce or eliminate illegal immigration. And the Dignity Act proposed by Maria Salazar, representative of the state of Florida, is one of the methods to do that. So now for a modest proposal. When you look backwards in time, the last piece of consequential legislation was in 1986 signed into law by the Reagan administration that granted amnesty to approximately 3 million immigrants who were here in the country illegally. And secondly, 
Congress was supposed to appropriate funding to tighten border security. The first part of the act was implemented, which was the amnesty. The second part was not fulfilled, which is Congress allocating funding to support strengthening border controls. You don't see any legislation of consequence being passed since that time period. In 2001, the Dreamers Act was proposed but did not pass. 2012, there was an executive order during the Obama administration to try to provide protections using the DACA construct. And then in 2022, Representative Salazar presented into committee the Dignity Act, which did not get traction during that time period while the House was controlled by Democrats. In 2023, once the House was controlled by Republicans, the Dignity Act now has greater traction. What you see is it's got bipartisan support both in the House and the Senate. It's going to be debated in committee and likely on the open floor. There are three key components of it that I want you to understand. One is this idea of border security. It's very much focused in this direction. Secondly, enforcement. Third, asylum reform. The asylum reform piece is a 12-year period that individuals who have entered the country illegally could transition and become citizens over that 12-year time period, both with a set of actions, restitution, and payment of fees of various types. The two pieces of this are built into a Dignity Act which is a seven plus year period where the individual would begin the process of transitioning towards citizenship. And then a second period of five years, which is a redemption period where the individual would potentially become a full citizen and be recognized as such over the totality of that 12 plus year time frame. Next is guest worker reform. This ties back into the guest worker program that already exists for agricultural workers. The idea is to expand this program to pick up other trades and other functions in the United States, of which construction could be one. Lastly, the fees and the restitution and the costs associated with these programs would be used to support American small businesses. And there's one final key component that I want you to understand. This act, as it is currently proposed, requires no taxpayer contribution. It is funded in entirety by the fees and the restitution paid by individuals who transition between the dignity and the redemption programs as they are described. With that, let's hear some of the specifics from Representative Salazar herself. My name is Maria Salazar. I represent District Number 27 in the state of Florida, and I'm the creator of a, of a bill called the Dignity Act. And that is not only a complete immigration reform, it's more than that. It's a national security bill, it's an immigration bill, it's an economic bill, it's a moral bill, because it gives dignity to millions and millions of illegals who live among us that do not have a way of living a dignified life in the promised land. Immigrants helped build this country, and I'm sure you know that. But they also built the Erie Canal on the New York skyscraper. The buildings, many of them in New York City, those very tall buildings that you see where they were built by the illegal or immigrant hands. They built the Transcontinental Railroad and drove westward expansion. They built the Hoover Dam. They built the first cars in American factories. They helped with planes that made us win World War II and many others. So the Dignity Bill at this hour, what it does is that it's going to help this country continue growing because it's going to provide the hands that the business sector needs so eagerly. It goes beyond what anyone says, but what I do assure you is that if we, without hands, any types of hands, the country will not be able to grow as it needs to because we do not have enough labor. We don't have enough workers to fill the 8 million jobs that are available at this hour. So what does the Dignity Act do? Well, first of all, it seals the border. Second, it ends catch and release. Third, it mandates E-Verify. Fourth, is not going to cost one penny to the taxpayers because the undocumented right now who will go into the dignity status will pay, will pay for that border security. Number three, there's the dignity status. And after the dignity status, 
whomever wants to become an American citizen will go then into the redemption status. I repeat, this is the moral thing to do. This is good policy for the country. This is going to help us grow and is going to provide any business sector in this country, whether it's agricultural, construction, hospitality, or any other sector, the hands that it needs in order to continue growing. On top of that, we're gonna fix the legal immigration because there are so many people that we need to bring into this country from Ukraine, from Canada, from Turkey, from Europe that wanna to come to the United States and stay in the United States and work. But they cannot because they don't have a legal pathway to do it. In other words, if Albert Einstein of 2023 wants to come to the United States, we will say no to him. And you know what happened when Albert Einstein came during World War II. We won the war. Let's talk about the American dream. The American dream is that we have a collective group of people that feel and think that in this country, everything is possible because of something called the American exceptionality. And if we stop allowing those human beings that have that same dream to come into the United States and help us grow, where anyone who has talent can come and share that talent with the rest of the country. That's why we are the number one economy in the world. My concern is that if we do not fix immigration in all its areas, we're gonna stop growing as a country. But not only that, it's the moral thing to do. If you have, what, 10, 15, 20 million illegals or undocumented, people who have been here for more than five years that have American kids, that have not committed a crime, who want to continue contributing to the economy, doing those jobs that no one else wants to do, but they do because they are very uh, grateful to have been able to come to the United States, then why don't we give them dignity? That doesn't mean that they are going to have a path to citizenship or that they want, they, or they want to become American citizens. Many will, but others won't. But they do want to live a dignified life in the promised land called the United States. And that's what my bill does. It gives those who are undocumented the path to live a dignified life in the promised land called the United States. By the same token, it helps the United States to continue growing and profiting from those hands who wanna come here and help the economy. As you've heard, there's great opportunity with the Dignity Act as proposed in 2023. As you're thinking through your perspectives on immigration, I wanna take you back to where we started, immigrants as complements, immigrants as substitutes. What the data shows is that immigrants fall more likely into the complement category and support growth and innovation throughout the United States. And when you look back over the arc of history, what you find is that immigrant populations have supported that growth and supported construction of infrastructure in the U.S. time and time again. As Representative Salazar from the great state of Florida laid out, there's an opportunity to fill the gap of over 40 years without any consequential immigration legislation. Let's find a way to support the Dignity Act in 2023. Thank you very much.